I believe it was Steve Allen who was uh, credited as being the first person to say that comedy is tragedy plus time. And Mark Twain once said, everyone is a moon and has a dark side, which he never shows to anybody. And that sort of sets up the theme to today's podcast. Hi, I'm Joe Johnson. Welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey, hey. And Andrew Walker. Yes, hello. And we have an interesting topic uh, this week. Um, yeah, it's interesting that the, the the icon for theater are the two masks. Uh, one is comedy, one is tragedy. And a lot of times they go hand in hand. And so today we're going to talk about um, how comedians, some of the uh, brightest and funniest comedians have um, left us early for one reason or another while it was, whether it was their, their own hand or, um, just excess or, uh, a loved one. Um, but that's going to be the theme of tonight's podcast is, uh, our, uh, our funny people. So, um, I, as I was researching this podcast, I came up with a, with a list of, uh, comedians that either left us too soon or had, uh, demons, a dark side. And you two can feel free to uh, chime in on this list. Oh, yeah. Um, the first one on the list is uh, Richard Pryor. Uh, one of the all-time greats. Some people might call him the greatest comedian ever. Um, he's on Mount Rushmore, for sure. <laughs> on the R- Mount Rushmore of comedians, he would definitely be on there. Um, and everyone knows that he's battled his demons and in 1980, while freebasing, uh, he caught himself on fire uh, with rum. And I remember hearing stories of him running down the street on fire. Um, and apparently, not only did that have an impact on him as far as why he turned his life around, but other comedians as well. Um, sadly, he died in 2005 at the age of 65. Um, after his third heart attack. So he didn't necessarily leave us as a young man, but my God, that guy battled demons his entire yep. life, yeah. yet was able to get on stage and make people laugh so hard that they would have tears in their eyes. Uh, some of his specials that you can find out there, like Live on Sunset Strip and stuff like that, um, are some of the funniest stand-up uh one hour or 90 minutes or whatever it is, some of the funniest stand-up performances you would ever see. You guys uh, fans of Richard Pryor? Yeah, and he's, uh, you could see a lot of his DNA in a lot of the big names of the last uh, 20 years. Like, yeah. Of course, Chappelle. Oh, sure. He, he, he definitely handed the torch with Chappelle. Uh, Eddie Murphy, man. Eddie, oh, yeah, Eddie Murphy. Direct influence. A, co- a couple years, uh, before, yeah. well, several years before Chappelle came on the scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, a gen- generational talent. Yeah. Uh, you know, influenced the, the ones coming after him. And you think about Blazing Saddles. Oh, yeah. He was a writer on Blazing yeah. Saddles, which not a lot of people know. And when people uh, say that, you know, Blazing Saddles has some racist humor in it, Mel Brooks is always quick to remind people that Richard Pryor, Pryor. wrote a lot yeah. of those jokes. People just uh, people who say they, they don't understand the context of the of the movie. Right. You know. Yeah, it's not celebrating it. It's yeah. poking fun at those <laughs> right. morons, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and he, he segued from a stand-up career to a, a, a fruitful movie career. Right. And, um, yeah, one of the all-time greats. How, how, how many yeah, Gene times? Gene Wilder. I was going to say, how many times did he pair, pair up with Gene? At least three, right? Uh, I remember Stir Crazy, uh, the one, Silver Streak, which is a great yeah. one. See No Evil, Hear No Evil. And that one, right. yeah. So I I've think never seen three any of them, but I remember yeah. as a kid just – you know, them yeah. being on here and there. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, great stuff. The, the the infamous prison scene in um, Stir Crazy. Stir Crazy when he lights the match <laughs> on the guy's chest. It, 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 you could just see a clip of that, and it's it's That's dropped. Right. It, it's dropped. It hilarious. Uh, another comedian that uh, died relatively young and had uh, just a, a dark uh, 
alternate side, uh, Lenny Bruce. Um, yeah. You know, he paved the way for comedians like George Carlin to go up there and 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 be a be a philosopher more than just to try and make people laugh. And also pushing the limit and really what could be said uh, outside of the home at that time. Exactly. And he got Hit. jailed many yeah. times for, you know, obscenities and stuff like that, which is so crazy when you think that, you know, the, our Bill of Rights includes the right to free speech. Here right. was a comedian who repeatedly got hauled off the jail because of what he said. And, and that was a mere... What fifty or sixty years ago? So yeah, it's not, we're not too. That was not what maybe mid ago. mid to late fifties when that happened. Yeah, people yeah. So we're not, imagine that was like in the dark ages or yeah, something. But we're no. not too far removed. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you think about someone like Lenny Bruce, and it's just, you know, that guy. He embodied the whole thing where the court jester can talk back to the king. Yeah, he's the only one that can talk back to the king. You're, yeah, you're able to to swing up and yeah. punch up really hard <laughs> at, at that point. Yeah. Yeah, and sadly he died of acute morphine poisoning by overdose at the age of forty. That's, uh, that's uh, I feel like that's going to be a theme. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bill Cosby. Let's talk about Bill Cosby, one of the greatest comedians, actors, performers of all time. One of my earliest memories. I had to have been four or five years old seeing Bill Cosby perform at the uh, Michigan State Fair. Now, think wow. about that. As a four-year-old or five-year-old, I remember knowing who he was and have the distinct memory of him making this roller coaster sound effect and pretending he was on a roller coaster. And wow. uh, one of the most influential comedians of all time, right. uh, his, his HBO special uh, himself is one of the greatest stand-up performances of all time with so many classic lines. Is that the one where he's sitting in the chair? Yeah, for the a good chair? part of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah my parents, I remember seeing that one. Yeah, com- com- comedic-wise. You... Oh, man. Bill Cosby. That is great. We're eating chocolate cake. Uh, it, it's awesome. And he never swore, except when he did swear, it was so out of character that people would fall out of their chairs when he would drop a swear word. Um, but then Hannibal Burris uh, <laughs> opened the floodgates, made a comment uh, in 2014. During a comedy routine, Hannibal Burris made some comment about everybody knows Bill Cosby, and everyone was like, no, what about Bill Cosby? <laughs> And brought it to light, and victims started stepping forward. And uh, I read that there were 33 victims who had stepped forward who accused Bill Cosby of bringing them back to their home, get, offering them a drink, spiking that drink with something which would render them unconscious, and then they would wake up with him, uh, you know, pulling himself off of. And here's the weird thing is, you know, he, he he would go in front of the media and say, uh, you know, I'm being harassed, I'm being pursued. His supporters would say, oh, this is this is a, um, a, a witch hunt, hunt you yeah. know, that sort of thing. But when he was sued uh, in a civil suit, uh, he admitted, he admitted it. He admitted that he would put something in a woman's drink. And, and yet that wasn't enough to convict him for life. He He did get convicted. But on a technicality, after one year, he was released from prison, and he's out there roaming around now. It's, Not that he's roaming around much these yeah, days. Yeah, I, but... I wonder what his daily r- routine is like. <laughs> right. I, I had heard that he, when he first knew that he would get released, that he had planned on you know, trying to do like a, a comeback tour yeah. across the country, and I thought... Bad idea. Well, yeah, that'd be that's, a... that's one of those things that's like... All right. Well, if if we're gonna ha- if we're gonna have a dumpster fire, I mean, count your legal blessings <laughs> that you're just out. Yeah, My yeah, and goodness. don't push your luck. Yeah, don't be like OJ and write a book. Saying, you know, interesting. What it, what it, this yeah. is how I would have done it, or whatever the title of that book. You know, but, oh, okay. <laughs> but the, the interesting thing is, you know, but it's one like kind of like what Joe was saying. You know, you sometimes have to. If you take the man as a total, yeah, it's it's horrible. But comedy, he's a great comedian. Yeah, just and like OJ was, was a great football player. You can't take that what he yeah, did on the field. Sure. But and, and and Cosby was America's dad. We all mm-hmm. tuned in and watched his show every week, where he dispensed the wise advice and yeah. and made everybody laugh. And then all Rudy. of a sudden, one day, <laughs> you know, Joe, it's also like you were saying. It, it was a shock to hear him swear. Yeah. And then it, a lot of people didn't know this, but same like Bob Saget. Oh yeah. Oh Bob sure. Saget as oh, Dan, so you know, foul, on Full yeah. House, and then you see his stand up. <laughs> America's Funniest Videos. That's yeah. what 99% of America knew him from was those right. two shows. Yeah. yeah, and then you see him on stage and you're like, oh, my God. It's kind of like Eddie Murphy when you think about it because we were introduced to Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live 
And then you see him in the movies and you see his HBO special and you're like, ooh, wow, okay. Yeah. And yeah, so again, they, they would put out this facade, this image, and then and then you start to dig and go, ooh, they're not that squeaky clean guy that you see on TV. Um, so yeah, and, and so that was such a shock um, when, when those accusations came to light. Um, let's talk a little bit about Chevy Chase. Now, Chevy Chase is still out there doing his thing, but he's, he's finding it more and more difficult to find work because based on my personal experience and what I've read online, just about everybody who's ever worked with him hates his guts. Mm -hmm. And I had read those stories and uh, I was lucky enough to be in a position uh, where I was in Hollywood uh, for a movie premiere. It was Burt Reynolds' movie premiere, The Last Movie Star, and Chevy Chase had a small role in it as his agent, as Burt Reynolds' agent in the movie. Okay. And so I'm at the premiere, and here comes Chevy Chase. And I'm excited because not many comedians and you know comic actors bigger than Chevy Chase. What a career. And he went through the red carpet, the media junket, you know, and then he sat down in this director's chair, and he had his daughter with him who was kind of helping him out. And I had brought a die-cast car uh, from uh, vacation with me, and I had a Sharpie in hand, had the die-cast car in my other hand, approached him and said, Mr. Chase, can I get you to sign this? And he turned around with this look of rage in his eyes and was angry at me right off the bat, raised his voice at me, and I was like, oh, my God. And he, he was just agitated and ready for a fight. And I remember at that moment thinking, the stories that I've read are true, that he has alienated just about everybody he's ever worked with. And then, I don't know if you guys heard the pretty famous story about the roast, the celebrity roast, that he had agreed to be roasted, but they couldn't find any f close friends or family who wanted to take part in it. So they just got whatever comedians that, that would agree to do it. And they just laid into him. They tore him up up was and this on comedy central it was on comedy central oh, wow and if i remember correctly he he couldn't take it and yeah he was like like actually crying or yeah well something. at the end of the roast the 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 roastee has the opportunity to zing everybody back right. so he goes up to the podium and you think oh he's gonna zing everybody and he said that was really painful <laughs> and walked off the stage <laughs> and I, unfortunately he 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 made his bed. I've read stories about community where yes. he, oh, yeah. he said really racist things to Donald Glover, and yep. he was just an awful human being. And yeah. I just hear story after story after story. And and my personal experience is that he suffers from some sort of mental illness. Yeah, I, I can't think of any other explanation why he was just so agitated right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, he ended up leaving the premiere. He didn't stay for the movie. He cut out. Um, didn't go to the after party or anything, and I thought, what a miserable human being. And yeah, it, it could be something uh, along the lines of depression or as yeah. you get older, you know. Well, apparently this goes way back because oh. even in the early days of SNL, he got into a fist fight with Bill Murray because yep, Chevy had left and Bill Murray had replaced him. And right. then when Chevy came back on to host or something, they got into a fist fight. So his reputation goes pretty far back. And were his good friends Dan Aykroyd back then? Would you say? Would you say Dan Aykroyd? Because they did Spies well, Like Us kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know him well enough to say that they were good friends. But um, yeah, they were in a lot of projects together, and they have that SNL history with them. Um, but yeah, and and I'd be curious just to see what Dan Aykroyd had to say about yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just don't know. I mean, if you guys you know, have heard anything. Yeah, I haven't. When I create a list of my all-time favorite movies, there are several Chevy Chase movies on there, Caddyshack and Vacation and Christmas Vacation. And here's one of the funniest men on the planet is a miserable human being in real life. And I, I don't understand that. I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that. <laughs> um, who else? Uh, Sam Kinison talking about uh, Demons. He, he was a former pastor who uh, battled his demons with drugs and alcohol. Uh, and this is sort of an ironic story, but he was able to kick all that. He got himself clean and sober uh, while he was doing the stand-up and everything. He was, I think he had either just gotten married or was going to get married and was heading to a gig in Vegas, I believe it was, when he was struck and killed by a drunk teenage driver. Yikes. And I thought, that's 
brutal that here's a guy who battled these demons for so long, was one of the few to really turn it around and uh, was taken out by a drunk driver. That's wow. that's uh, cruel irony right yeah. there. Um, he was only 38 years old. Um, let's talk about Robin Williams. Um, oh, man. Robin Williams, again, most consider him probably the greatest stand-up of all time. I mean, he was just this manic, wild personality um, where he, when he was on a talk show, you didn't know what he was going to do. He would pop up out of his chair and go up into the audience, and the cameras are you know, spinning around trying to keep up with him. Um, on the surface, he was one of the funniest guys on the planet, but beneath that surface was a dark, dark human being who, again, battled his demons and um, battled depression and... Uh, even yeah. though he, you know, he he got through it um, for a lot of his life, it it finally caught up with him, and he was diagnosed with a, a condition that was similar to dementia. And at the end, there he he was found. Uh, he had hung himself in his own closet in his home in uh, 2005. Um, and again, another guy who everybody loved, everybody laughed uh, with, and um, but there was just this bubbling beneath the surface was torment and and anxiety and depression and oh my god it's one of those things where i had no idea never saw that coming what was your reaction to robin williams i i was shocked um i heard about the depression and all the kind of stuff in the interviews but it was it it hurt you you just think of how funny the guy was at at a drop of a hat i know and andrew you have improv experience Mm -hmm. so the ability to just to think on the fly. You were talking about talk shows. The guy could take anything, a moment, yeah. and he could turn into a bit. Yeah, for, yeah. He could riff on that for a good five seconds. And some people just thought, oh, you know, this guy. It's like Johnny Carson, you know. Like you do, you know, tons of shows a year. If you can get, you know, four to three out of five shows a good week, you can do it. So maybe not all the jokes landed, and <laughs> he would know that because he's just you know manic. But yeah, no, Rob Williams is great. It's it was a tragic loss. Yeah, and it's 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 not extremely common uh to find someone who was uh in a that had an a plus doing uh stand up and improv right right <clears throat> you know that cross the, like yeah i don't know if if richard Pryor would be able to necessarily do the type of meandering <laughs> you know improv stream that, of yeah, consciousness that Robin Williams, yeah, yeah. I, now I, I can't say that for a fact because i i'm not as familiar with richard Pryor and other mm-hmm. stuff you might have done um but i'm just saying he's one of those slightly more rare talents that um he could do anything he he was a he was a true clown that all he wanted to do with that was just to make people laugh yeah no matter what uh you know movies he did he did some serious movies you know later in his career like uh insomnia oh know, yeah christopher nolan uh, and, uh, and the one, photo. Photo. one hour photo one hour, yeah, photo. One hour photo. Yeah. um and then those he was great too yeah uh whatever whatever script he was given he always performed well on yeah and uh, if, if something wasn't great that he did, it, pr- it probably wasn't his fault. I, I, I mean, think it was what, probably just bad writing. Yeah. <laughs> what, what what was great is he refused to be typecast as just a comedian. Oh, yeah. He branched out into more dramatic roles. Mm-hmm. You could, yeah. Even, there's a movie, what, what Dreams May Come. It may not have been that popular of a movie, but his performance in that was still pretty yeah. pretty decent. And then you think Good Will Hunting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, think about it, with uh, two movies coming to mind, um, Good Morning Vietnam and yeah. Aladdin. They just basically would roll, and he would just do his own thing. Yeah. And then they had to sort through hours and hours of him riffing and ad-libbing, ad-libbing trying to figure out what they can fit into these movies. I what? think that was one of the rare instances where the Disney animators were like, all right, we'll just pick whatever he's doing and we'll just draw that. <laughs> yeah. Animate his riffing, yeah. Now, interestingly, uh, talking about Robin Williams, here's my segue uh, Robin Williams was one of the last people to see John Belushi alive. Um, and that's, that brings us to my contribution to today's podcast uh, is the legendary John Belushi. Um, he, at the time, this was in 1980, I believe, uh, John Belushi was staying at the Chateau Marmont, which we talked about on yeah. previous podcasts. Mm-hmm. He was staying in a bungalow there. Uh, he was trying to revive his career, had some projects in mind that he wanted to do, was meeting with producers who saw that he just wasn't quite right. And uh, the very last night that Belushi was alive, he partied with Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. Oh, um, I didn't, I didn't and, know that. Wow. Yeah. 
And there was a, another woman there. I don't know if she was there at the same time, but at some point she was there. Um, her name was, and I have it here, Kathy Smith um, was in the bungalow as well. So imagine Robin Williams, Robert De Niro partying with John Belushi. They, they did lines of Coke and whatever was there. They left uh, only to find out the next day that Belushi was gone. And the story goes that um, his trainer, um, let's see, in the early morning hours, March 5th, 1982 was the year, uh, Belushi was visited by Robin Williams, Robert De Niro, and Kathy Smith. Uh, around noon the following day, his fitness trainer and bodyguard Bill Wallace showed up uh, to deliver a typewriter and a cassette recorder to Belushi, uh, only to find him dead, and he started making panicked phone calls trying to get people over there. Um, it was revealed that his cause of death was a mix of cocaine and heroin known as a speedball. He was only 33 years old. Imagine wow. the impact that he had on comedy and comedians at 33, and he was gone. Um, an amazing career. He, uh, he was born of Albanian-American pre- uh, parents, Uh, Joined Chicago's Second City in 1971, moved to New York to work with National Lampoon, um, was hired in 1975 as one of the original cast members of SNL. Uh, He was there four years uh, while he was there. Him and uh, Dan Aykroyd, who was his best friend, uh, created the Blues Brothers as a comedy musical act on Saturday Night Live that then uh, branched out into the movie. Um, but even during this time at SNL, he almost got fired several times because of his drug problems. His drug p- problems were, were threatening his uh, stay on SNL. Um, when he left SNL, he did Animal House, one of my all-time favorite movies. Uh, 1941, which I think is an underrated movie. Right. Steven Spielberg right. tries to distance himself from 1941. I really enjoyed it. If you guys haven't seen it, I, I haven't, but I, won't, I, won't. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, and then Blues Brothers came out in, in 1980. Again, one of my all-time uh, favorite movies. Uh, Kathy Smith was the one who injected him with the lethal speedball. Uh, initially, she was let go, but later on, she was doing an interview with the National Enquirer. You know, those hard-hitting journalists at the National Enquirer. Uh, she admitted during the interview that she's the one who injected the fatal speedball into John Belushi. Jeez. And that was enough for the authorities to come calling. <laughs> and so four years after John Belushi's death, uh, she plea bargained to involuntary manslaughter and served 15 months in prison, four years later. Um, so Belushi's buried in an unmarked grave in Massachusetts because initially I think he had a marked grave, but fans were desecrating it and, and hanging out there and oh. leaving garbage and things behind at the grave site. So they, they moved his uh, grave site, an unmarked grave site, um, even though I think there's a marker next to his mother's grave site, um, which serves as, there's a word for it. I forget what the word for it is, but it serves as sort of a memorial marker to John Belushi, but it doesn't okay. actually mark his actual grave site. Hmm. Um, A lot of people consider him the greatest SNL cast member of all time. Uh, One thing, we talked about this before, one thing that I always think about when somebody like that dies young is what would we have seen come from them had they lived? Um, And so some projects that he was sort of pushing and that he wanted to be involved with, um, there was a a scandal uh, in the 70s or 80s called ABSCAM, A-B-S-C-A-M, and it's where a whole bunch of um, uh, politicians got caught on video taking bribes from fake Arab uh, oil dealers or something like that. <laughs> and Belushi wanted to do a movie on that. I don't know if it was going to have a comic tone or whatever, um, but the movie was going to be called Moon Over Miami. Uh, that's one project that he was tied to. Um, he also was pitching a movie about a diamond smuggling caper uh, called Noble Rot. Um, he was also tapped to star in the, the movie version of the book, The Joy of Sex, Whoa. which I don't know if, if you could adapt that into a movie. It hasn't been done since that I'm aware of. Right. Um, but I had read that uh, 
in the script, at one point, Belushi was going to have to appear in a diaper, which uh, I don't know if he'd agreed to that. Well, Aykroyd stepped in and told Belushi, uh, let's not do Joy of Sex. I'm working on a little script that I call Ghostbusters, and I want you to be in it. Uh, of course, that never uh, came to fruition. Um, and then finally, uh, he, he wanted to, and this was a big passion project of his, his, he wanted to do a drug trafficking film called Kingpin. And he wanted to portray like people who used and, and, uh, delivered marijuana. He wanted to portray them as almost like Robin Hood type heroes, that sort of thing. So that was a passion project of his. And so all of those were in some form of debel- development when he passed away. And do, uh, do we know in. what, what part? Uh, um, Aykroyd wrote for him, and uh, it was it was, was going to be Bill Murray's role. Was it Bill Murray's role? Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, Bill could have stepped in and replaced him in that. But uh, wow. one okay. could, and they were also going to have Eddie Murphy play. The, he was meant to be in the original. Really? Yeah, yeah. Eddie Murphy was supposed to be in. Um, uh, he was supposed I, to be Winston. I, Winston. Oh. Yeah. Um, for some reason, he turned it down. When Ernie Hudson accepted the role in Ghostbusters, he thought he was inheriting the uh, Eddie Murphy role. But then he found out that when Eddie Murphy backed out, they had pretty much eliminated that character yeah. and had him come halfway through the movie. And he's like, well, this isn't what I signed up for. But that's what he ended up doing. So wow. it would have been a completely longer role and more involved had Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Eddie wanted there, to but... do the movie. I think it was the execs. There was a thing about... Uh, they, you know, could we get him out? And like, I don't know, do we need him in the movie? And they were like, well, Dan Aykroyd was like, you know, wrote, you know, he's supposed to be in it. <laughs> so you think what might have been with having Belushi and Eddie Murphy, you talk about an alternate history. Yeah. For, yeah, what might have been, right. uh, you know, he dabbled in some serious uh, things, um, but, uh, you know, he was considered one of the greatest comedians of all time. And Here's something that's a a little ironic. So during his stint at SNL, he did a little short film uh, where he plays an old John Belushi. It's like a little experimental um, short film. And I want to play a little clip here. And it's eerie. It's eerie when you hear this. Yeah, well, I thought I'd be the first to go. I was one of those. Live fast, die young, leave a good-looking corpse type, you know? Well, I guess they were wrong. Here they are. All my friends. This is a not ready for prime time cemetery. <laughs> On up. Oh, this is Garrett Morris. Now, Garrett, Garrett left the show and then worked in the Black Theater for years. And he died of an overdose of heroin. <laughs> Gives you goosebumps, doesn't it? Yeah. So here he was doing this sketch where he predicted that he would be dancing, and that's how the, the film ends. He's dancing on the graves of his fellow SNL cast members. He predicted he would be the last one standing, and he would dance on their graves, and I'll show them. And uh, he was the first to go, and maybe he saw it coming. Maybe that's where the joke was in this film, is everyone probably thought he was going to be the first to go. And that's exactly how it played out. And it's so eerie to to see him uh, in that little short film as an old man set, predicting that he was going to outlive everybody when he was actually the first to go. Hmm. Uh, pretty eerie. Yeah. I mean, and you think about the demons that he was battling at that time. It just, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, so he's been battling those demons his whole life. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the story that I wanted to talk about today and, what might have been uh, with John Belushi. Uh, Imaginos Pete, what did you bring to the table today? Well, I have an, uh, another SNL uh, cast member. This one is Chris Farley. And you talk about an eerie parallel. Uh, he idolized John Belushi. And uh, he, you know, both from Chicago, both did Second City, both then got recruited to SNL, both did five years, or four to five years, and then... Mm-hmm. Both died at the age of 33 because of a speedball wow. overdose yeah. uh, that led to a fatal heart attack. And it's just, it, it's it's truly tragic. You know, it's interesting that you talk about Chevy Chase in, earlier. Chevy Chase once told Chris Farley, I, I guess this was the form of tough love, like, because everyone kind of knew that Chris Farley had a drug and alcohol problem that was 
and he had issues with his weight, and it kept going on. So that, you know, you talk about three ma- primary demons that began earlier in his ch- you know his childhood because he was a little bit overweight. He get bullied, and these were some of the early things. But Chevy Chase told him, "Hey, you're not John Belushi. You you, <laughs> you haven't done enough yet to yeah. be John Belushi, so you can't party like John Belushi." Yeah. So thinking that would like oh you know s- you know set him straight. And I remember Lauren in one of the in one of the documentaries I saw Lauren Michaels reached out to Tom Arnold to be his sponsor to kind of like check in on him. Mm. Tom Arnold became his sponsor for Chris Farley, and Tom Arnold t- kind of told Chris Farley, "Hey, you can either be you can either do the drugs or you can be fat. You can't do both. <laughs> yeah, because oh, that's that's a, that's a lethal deadly, combination. It, yeah, it's a deadly combination. You you can either eat." Or you can do the drugs and alcohol. Don't do both, man. Yeah. Because I'm speaking from experience. Because Tom Arnold was a pretty big guy too. Yeah. He said, you know, I pick drugs. <laughs> you know, I pick alcohol. You know, and I and I go to rehab for it because Tom Arnold lost a lot of weight. So mm-hmm. it's just, uh, you talk about uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, Robin Williams. Everyone who knew Chris Farley said that he gave a lot more. It's basically he gave joy but kept none for himself. It's like that old, old one of those old quotes which I can't remember who said it. I give hope, though I keep none for myself. Mm. So Robin Williams would always give. Chris Farley would always give. And it's one of those things where comedy is like the greatest defense mechanism. You know, they, yeah. they, they even do talk about this when it comes to uh, psychi- um, in um, medical psychology, and that it's, it's, a, it's a healthy defense mechanism. I'm humor. Like, hey, hey, I'm uncomfortable. I'm battling depression. I'm battling all these other kind of things. So jokes is one way for me to cope with it bring people in and mm-hmm. kind of reveal the pain I'm going through. And so that was part of the thing that fueled him. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if I could say something to Chris yeah. Farley, if I could go back in time and say something, to Chris Farley, one thing that I learned after his death that broke my heart is he felt that people were laughing at him yes, because of his size, because of his weight. Oh. And it was an easy laugh. And he didn't seem to realize that people like me, his fans, laughed with him yep. i thought he was one of the funniest guys to ever walk this earth but when he heard the laughter he felt like they were laughing at him and it breaks breaks my heart um Joe, you know people bring up the yeah. chippendale sketch yes. when he does the chippendale sketch with patrick swayze and i remember seeing that and having tears in my eyes but they said that that sketch pretty much destroyed him was because... one of the tri- chris rock actually said about that no i mean yeah. joe i hate to cut you off on this no no thing. no go ahead no but yeah no go ahead andrew no you know. i was gonna say i i no this is i didn't know this about so chris rock chris, was, chris rock also joined the, the the snl around the same time along with david spade and adam sandler and chris farley so that you talk about like an all-star oh what a great era yeah, yeah when they brought brought in chris rock remembered hearing the sketch and going okay this is wrong because you know first of all you're laughing at him Chris Farley called Tom Arnold and reached out. I was like, hey, I guess they're doing the laugh at the fat guy kind of thing because they're going to take my sh- I'm going to have to take my shirt off and dance next to him. Tom Arnold's like, dude, just turn into it. Just give it everything. Mm. What Chris Rock was like, look, I guess if you're going to do it, at the end, have him win. Right, right. But at the very end, they for whatever reason, you know, and Lauren Michael signed off on this. And Lauren, to his credit, always tried to look out for Chris Farley. But this is one of those things that Chris Rock would just say, I don't know what happened. When they wrote the sketch, you know, someone should have stepped in and said, "Hey, why he loses in the end? Like they give it to Patrick Swayze." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like, Kevin Nealon says to him at the end of the sketch, "You're you're just so out of shape." And it's like that was kind of painful when yeah. when it got to the end of that sketch, and I was like, "Ooh, that's kind of mean." Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a memorable sketch, funny, and then everyone just kind of kind of pushes away the ending. Yeah, realizing oh he didn't get it. They always just focus on the the, hmm. the dancing part, and it's yeah. And they cite that as one of the things that kind of reinforced the old demons. Like, hey, if I'm, if I'm a big kid, I'm being bullied. I'm going. People are laughing at me. I'm just going to beat them to the punch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I have a story. A friend of mine. I'm not going to name names, but a friend of mine had a friend who worked on SNL. He did lighting, grips, that sort of thing. And his friend would occasionally invite him to come to rehearsals and come to the show and come to the cast party. And I'll never forget the story that my friend told me is he went to the after show cast party when Farley had come back to host. And uh, so he's at at the cast party. Farley comes walking past. Uh, The guy that worked on the show stopped Farley and said, this is my friend. 
And he said, Chris turned and looked at him and said, how you doing? And grabbed his hand, shook his hand and like walked off. And my friend turned to his friend and said, Farley looks terrible. Yeah. And his buddy said, shut up. You're going to get us thrown out of here. Don't say anything. And I guess he was ashen and looked awful. Hmm. Of, co- of this course, is... this was at the end of the show, you know, the end of the, the performance. I think two months before he, uh, he, he passed away. And there you go. He died like two months later after he had hosted SNL. He was and my he was friend overweight. saw yeah. it. Like, he doesn't look well. And I don't know. Maybe everyone was afraid to step in. People were afraid to intervene. And I think Dan Aykroyd called it predestination. Yeah. At some point, at that point, it's almost like gravity. It would take a miracle to pull him out of it because at his weight, he'd always struggle with his weight too. He'd been in 17 stints of rehab mm. in and out. But he had gotten, at that point, so overweight that he was having trouble with stamina and keeping up with the skits. And so you talk about your your, your friend noticing it. Mm-hmm. Even the performance was like, oh, my God, can he, can he do this? And he looked, he was visibly struggling, and it was it's yeah. tragic. I mean. Yeah. Now, do you recall if, uh, I haven't done the research on Farley, but do you recall if someone was charged with his death similar to Belushi's death? No, wasn't but there a woman who? There was a woman. Allegedly, there was a, a a call girl who was with him, and instead of having you know paying for what a call girl services are, because we're trying to keep this PG, <laughs> but uh, she basically turned him on to uh, drugs, and the drug at that time was cocaine. So this was uh, huh. about the thirty six to forty eight hours before his death. You know, he was supposed to meet up with some friends for for lunch, and he never showed. And his brother John Farley found him in his apartment on December eighteenth at the age of thirty three, dead. And oh. it, he because of speedball, he was in his pajamas, and mm. you know, and it was it was it's sad. But what happened was it took months for the autopsy report to come on. That's why people are going like, what took you know, you know, he died in December, and it. It didn't come out. Oh, not weeks. It took weeks, you know, for it to come out. And yeah. they were just like, why, "Why? Why did it take so long for the autopsy report to come out?" You know. And so, hmm. it, it, he had basically been on a little bit of a bender before that. He had gone to a club called Karma. This is allegedly in one of the articles. He had been out for a long time. Brought the party back home, and then you know ha- went to a pub crawl. So it's yeah. It what they always said, you know. And Joe, you're talking about this. When they not only saw him physically struggling, those some of his friends in those last two months said, "Wow, he looks." He, he would sit in a corner and be kind of down. Yeah, yeah. You talk about those after parties where this guy's the life of the party. Mm-hmm. That, that was his reputation. You know, he'd say a joke and he just kind of goes off to the side and he sits down. He looks down and you're like, "Oh God," you know, the guy's giving joy but has none for himself. And yeah, yeah. He he actually said in one of those interviews where he'd say, "You know, I'd love to you know sit down and be loved." You know, I'd love to have a family because he grew up in the, in Madison. Wisconsin, you know, you talk about a true right. Western kid, and you know, mm. so it's yeah, it, it it's and what might have been he was actually in line to play Shrek. He had actually yeah. recorded lines for Shrek. Wow. When we talk about what might have been, right. from, from what I read, he had recorded like ninety percent of the dialogue from Shrek, and they probably could have released it with his voice in it, but I, I think they decided it might not be in good taste to do that. I wonder if we could. Uh, catch some audio of that somewhere online. It's, it, oh, is it is out there. Yeah, oh, it, it is. is out there. Yeah, oh. yeah. In the, one of the do- documentaries I watched, you act, they actually show the, the, the pencil drawing. Yeah, the pencil the drawing. And he has like really? a little bit of a southern twang to it. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd drawn it differently. And Mike, I remember Mike Myers was really uncomfortable at first to take that role, but oh, people yeah. said, you know, yeah. y- you would be the one to do it. Yeah, and make it your own. Yeah. Don't impersonate Farley. Just do your own thing. So. Yeah. Um, Mike Myers ended up doing the Scottish accent, which I believe was based on his father. Uh, so he took it in yes. a completely different direction. But the the audio is out there, and you can't help but wonder what might have been. And and like Belushi, yeah. um, when they when they announced uh, Farley's death, and I saw it on the news, it's, the reaction is an unusual reaction because the initial reaction is you know shock and sadness, but then you're like, well, you know, we all kind of saw this coming. Like, it wasn't a big surprise. We right. saw it coming. His weight had ballooned, and he was so manic that I think a lot of us were like, he's not long of this earth. Like, he, he's a flaming comet that uh, isn't going to last much longer. So it was, it was a very sad and tragic story, but not surprising. You know, Jonah Hill and Adam McKay were being interviewed, I think, for Rolling Stone or one of those magazines, and, they, and Jonah Hill said, 
you know, when John Belushi died, there was like this punk rock romanticizing thing about him. But when Chris Farley died, he's like, it was just sad. Everyone cried. It was like, oh my God, yeah. you know, like there was nothing romantic about it. It was just, no. it was tragic. Sad and tragic. Yeah. Uh, Tom Arnold was with Kevin Farley, his brother, and uh, I forgot who else. And they got a call and said, hey, it's about Chris. And Tom Arnold apparently right away knew and he said he, he effing did it. Yeah. Kevin, he effing did it. Chris effing did it. And it was like, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So two identical stories there. You know, one guy emulating his hero. They both go out uh, the exact same way at the exact same age, having had a huge impact on the comedy world. It's, I, I'd uh, it's encourage amazing. the audience to go check out their two really good documentaries that you can find on YouTube. Mm. You just type in Chris Farley documentaries and they'll, they'll come up. One was done by a Canadian company and uh, the other one, I forgot who did it, but you know, it's really it's really well done. I mean, they go yeah. into the depth of it. I mean, they can only – you have to piece it together. But, yeah, yeah. What, another thing, as far as future projects go, the one thing that I that makes me sad is I thought David Spade and Chris Farley and Tommy Boy was like Hope and Crosby. Like, yeah. they bounced off each other so well, and they did Black Sheep after that, which wasn't as good as Tommy Boy, but I thought it had, it had its moments – and I was hoping that we were going to get a whole series of buddy comedies from Spade and Farley. Like, they would be the next big movie comedy duo. People compared them to Laurel and Hardy. They'd yeah. be the next Laurel and Hardy. And uh, you know what's interesting thing? This actually was, you talk about what might have been projects. He also wanted to do serious acting. Yeah. Because he, he had that ability in him. And in the documentary, they talk about this one scene in Tommy Boy when he's talking to potential girlfriend about and they're in the dinghy yeah and, and you get you get the moments of what he could what he could convey without the, without the physical humor he was in line to do the biography of uh fatty, fatty arbuckle, arbuckle. Yes. yeah and, oh wow yeah and here's another weird footnote and then andrew will let you do your piece but there's this rumor this curse that's going around that there is a script that's been floating around hollywood for years if not decades and some of the names that were attached to this script which was called like atuk of the north or something atuk supposed to be about like an eskimo or whatever the names that were attached to it were belushi farley and uh john candy and all of them Whoa. died suddenly and so a curse had been attached to the script so since then people are like i am not touching <laughs> that script so there's a little footnote on that wow. so. a little eerie 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 add on here to the hollywood crime scene that's right yeah. all right and andrew we're gonna shine the spotlight on all right, you yeah. i'm keeping with snl also uh i'm gonna talk about a guy who met his untimely end in a, a very different way uh phil hartman uh so yeah. he was on the show from 80 86 to 94 so he kind of overlapped with uh what year did farley come on Farley yeah, came out in 1990. Did. So, see, he, he would They have, did overlap. Yeah. They yeah. would have known each other pro probably fairly well in those Oh, yeah. Some of the most seasons. iconic s sketches is Van Down by the River with Matt Foley. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and yeah, and Phil yeah. Hartman's yeah. the dad. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which, doing a, doing a, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, homework, uh, I, 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 I just noticed that it, it was Bob Odenkirk who wrote that sketch. Yes. Oh, wow. And looking... At Bob Odenkirk today, who's probably about sixty, I'm guessing, almost sixty years old, he kind of reminds me of Phil Hartman. That he he would always play like the everyman. Mm -hmm. He could always be kind of a jerk, kind of seedy. Yeah. Um, but uh, in real life, they like they were are they are were great people to work with. Yeah, and like we're true team players. Everyone loved them. Yeah. A, a lot of yeah. a lot of comedians that I like love today. Grew up kind of being mentored in the alt uh, comedy scene in, of the '90s by Bob Odenkirk and a lot of those guys, and said like, he's the kind of guy that once he achieves a position, he 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 passes he, the baton and, or, or reaches the or puts the ladder down and, and pulls you up. With oh him. yeah, yeah, yeah. Very right. collaborative. And um, so back to Phil Hartman, his wife um, shot him while he was sleeping, and. Um, we're not going to go into too much details about her because I don't think someone like that deserves uh, much notoriety. But uh, yeah, she had m mental uh, issues and severe uh, substance abuse issues. Um, apparently, uh, everyone knew the marriage sucked, and uh, I, apparently uh, Joe Rogan 
had become friends with uh, Phil and told him to leave his wife several times. And he basically couldn't go because... Uh, well, they had children, they had right? Two, they had two yeah. kids, so... And Phil was trying to be committed. They, they, that was yeah. because they were on that same that sitcom together. News, news radio. News radio, yeah. Right. So um, the, the only, I guess, the only like negative, and this maybe can't really be considered too negative, but the only thing about his personal life they came across is that um, in his personal life, he was very uh, withdrawn and um, was a little too emotionally checked out, which, you know, we all have our, our, our blind spots, uh, and that was according to his ex-wife. So I can see that, but uh, as far as I know, didn't wasn't much of a partier, or at least that we knew about. Um, yeah. Didn't seem to, just seemed to be like a nice, everyman dude, yeah. to, with everybody that he worked with. And my number one thing that I love about him is that he co-created one of my favorite characters in all of Americana, Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> yeah, with Paul Rubens. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, in the right. mid seventies uh, when they were both studying at Groundlings. Yeah, and he played Captain Carl in the yep. uh, the stage play and Pee Wee's uh, Playhouse. Yep, and he played uh, at the very end of uh, uh, Big Adventure. He plays a reporter that interviews him at his big premiere of his movie, and he co-wrote the script with right with Paul Rubin. So all time favorite movies, yeah. right? Same here. And uh, just think about that that mind that could sit down and and come up with something so comically. Idiotic, but funny, and innocent yet subversive in a really weird yeah. way. Yeah, that you could watch with your kids, or you know, just anybody who wants to sit down and have a weird, funny time. And think about his contribution to The Simpsons. Oh, oh yeah, so many characters: Troy McClure, Kent Brockman. Uh, was it Kent Brockman? No, 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 no. no, no. He did Troy McClure. Lionel Hutz. Lionel, Lionel Hutz, the, the lawyer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the lawyer. And Troy McClure. And his his contributions to The Simpsons, from what I've read, they just loved him when he came in to record his part of the script. It was just a happy day in the studio to have him in there doing his thing. Oh man, his contributions. I've I've never heard uh, him say this or it be written, but I wonder if uh, Odenkirk took a little inspiration for Saul, yeah, from Lionel Hutz. <laughs> oh, I mean, if, if he you know if he didn't do it uh, on purpose, he did it unconsciously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it could have just bled through through osmosis. Yeah. One so. of my favorite uh, moments with uh, Troy McClure, I think it was, is the Planet of the Apes musical yes. on The Simpsons. Get your damn hands <laughs> off me, you damn dirty apes or whatever. And yeah. uh, oh, he, he was just so great in that. And then an underrated movie that doesn't seem to have stood the test of time, but I really enjoyed when it came out, was Small Soldiers. And that was one of his last movies where the, yeah. the little toys come to life. And I never, um, I never saw that. Yeah, really I need good to movie. revisit that. I need to revisit that. Very underrated. Yeah. Yeah, and you know he always played you know this. He never really played the leading man role in the movies, but he was a great character actor and he contributed. And um, but that was probably as close to a leading role as he's ever had was in Small Soldiers. So be sure to check that out. And uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say about him, but uh, just going through his Wikipedia profile, uh, some of his uh, SNL cast members said that um, like nobody had anything negative ever to say about him, yeah. like in private. And that in at least the couple years, well, not, not a couple, uh, probably eight or nine years that he was there, that he was, he had the nickname of the glue because yeah. he could yeah. he could keep everything together. Yeah, he wasn't going to be the Eddie Murphy or the, the like the star that the hot yeah. one that year, but whatever he's given, he's going to give it. Yeah. A plus. He was the, the commercial parody guy, Colin Blow. Yeah. Um, he was the straight man. He was the game show host. Yeah. Yes. He, um, he always a, a great yeah. straight man. He had a, he had a certain um, look and a certain voice where he knew yeah. how to play those type of characters. Yeah. And, I love uh, uh, Unfrozen yeah. Caveman Lawyer. Yeah. Yes. Your Honor. And they're like, Mr. Key Rock. It's just Key Rock, ma'am. Now I'm just a caveman, and oh my God, where did he come up with that? And you and you think I think Andrew, you were talking about this for someone who didn't originally have comedic roots. He was actually started off at, in in the visual field, like he was actually yes. designing logos and all that kind of stuff. But so he had that natural comedy, and someone just said, "Hey, you know, let's see it." Yep, he he helped design a couple uh, uh, album covers in the the mid '70s for I think it. 
he helped to work on one of the uh, Steely Dan albums with, you know, mm. so he wow. he was in in, in that kind of indie art world, and then he st- thought, I think one day, you know, I'm just gonna <laughs> take some comedy classes here out out here in L.A. and yeah, in the mid '70s, and I would probably put him in my top ten favorite SNL yeah uh, he, performers. He's, he's he's on a lot of a lot of those lists. Yeah. yeah, I I would say Joe, you were showing me this before the podcast. You know, when we do the prep for the show, when he left, when Phil Hartman, his final, when he when he leaves the show, he does a bit with uh, a farewell message with Chris Farley. He does, and I have it right here. You know, I can't imagine a more dignified way to end my eight years on this program. <laughs> Goodbye. 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 So imagine watching that live on the air, his last episode after eight years of SNL, him cuddling with Farley on that stage. Who could have predicted the tragic end for both of those performers? Uh, not too far apart, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. Just four years later, uh, yeah. I think b- both of them in '98. Yeah, I, mean, I believe. Man, well, '97 for Farley, but yeah, '98. Oh, okay. '98. Right. Yeah, so very, very soon. Yeah. Kind of an interesting uh, footnote. You know, you were you were sort of bad mouthing his wife Bryn. Yeah. Uh, there's a footnote to that where she was trying to get clean and sober. Okay. And John Lovitz, who has been very vocal about this in interviews and stuff. Blames Andy Dick, who yes. I ran into on Hollywood Boulevard one time. Oh, he had a goodness. young young boy toy in his arm. Um, <laughs> he did. And uh, I surprise, ran into him surprise. on Hollywood. But um, John Lovitz blames Andy Dick for getting Bryn hooked on drugs again. That she, here she was trying to get herself cleaned up. Yeah, knocking and her off somehow, the wagon. yeah, Andy Dick provided some cocaine to her or whatever, and she fell off the wagon and... Uh, John Lovitz had gotten into fist fights with Andy Dick over it. Wow. Um, and so basically John Lovitz blames Andy Dick for Phil Hartman's death. Wow. So kind of a weird twist there. But. Yeah. Uh. You know, you talk about Phil Hartman being the glue. And <clears throat> Phil Hartman could write some really good sketches. Mm-hmm. And what's one thing Chris Farley could never do, uh, whether he was never encouraged to or never had the confidence to do it, he never... He tried writing one sketch; it tanked completely in, in mm. the table read. So they were like, "David Spade's like air." Eh. So, but what he had the ability to do was, you write you write a part, he'll take it and amplify it, and make it great. Yeah, yeah. He he, he always knew how to how to uh, elevate and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he'll take that yeah. idea, and then Mike Myers is like, "Dude, I could write something." And he would come in, and he's and Adam Sandler would write something, and he would just take it to the next level. But yeah, he's very boisterous. But he'd always yeah. wanted to write; like he always felt yeah. like there was. And who knows, like you said, what what might have been. Yeah. yeah. Now, a little tidbit about the, the Matt Foley character. I had read that when Farley would perform that on stage, if he knew someone in the audience, a friend of his was sitting in the audience, he would adopt yes. that person's name when he would come out and, <laughs> and he would introduce himself as that friend in the audience who would be like, oh, he's using my name. And the, the day he performed that on SNL, his friend Matt Foley was sitting in the audience and so he introduced himself as Matt Foley, and that's the one that stuck because it was a national audience. And wow. the, and the real life Matt Foley, the re- actual name, full first and last, <laughs> is now known as Father Matt Foley. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he remembers going, "Oh boy!" When he first came, it was like he put, kind of put his hat down. Was like, "Oh, I hope this is going to end well," and it did. You know, he's like, "I'm I was humbled." Wow. You know that, yeah. that and yeah, he, he would do that, and it was. And that kind of circles back though to the type of heart that he had, like. Yeah. Robin Williams. Right, right. Yeah. He was always a giver and always generous, you know, with with uh time, always conscious of wanting to make you laugh to the I guess almost to the detriment of 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 themselves where they couldn't take care of themselves. Yeah. You know, um, I I'd yeah. love to get your guys thoughts on this because this has always been like a a stick, you know, that you know, in my eye on this kind of thing. Why does Hollywood not respect comedy? And I think we both. Yeah, there's very rarely do they re- receive recognition at the Academy Awards. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and what, what's what specifically do you mean by that? The, well, the Academy Awards. Yeah, is yeah, the Academy, well, besides, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, they when okay. For instance, let me tell with, with Chris Farley when he decided to do movies when and when Tommy Boy came out. Now, uh, apparently, it's in the top ten list of all VHS tapes ever ordered by Paramount. Mm. Oh. And I remember the 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 director was like, "Oh wait, Raiders is on there." Like, nope, you guys are you guys are up there. You're in the top ten. I think you're actually surpassing Raiders. Wow. Tommy Boy was basically became a cult f- classic yeah. at, well after time, but. Farley apparently didn't like movies so much as TV because TV felt like a nine to five. Mm. Whereas, and when it came to movies, you're at the behest of the critics. Right. And the critics would just love to tear. You know, comedy oh. is the easiest thing to tear down. Critics always they they tore down Caddyshack. They tore down yeah. Airplane. And, and for Caddyshack, they said uh, Ted Knight was slumming. And and it's like you look back. Those are some of the funniest movies of all time. Critics are just snobs. I wish you could confront yeah. these guys. Like, did yeah. you write this? Are you still alive? Did you write this? Sh-? Yeah, yeah. You I know. think I think uh, Roger Ebert has apologized for some of his uh, reviews. But, um, yeah, the, the critics do not respect uh, the comedies. And those are some of my all-time favorite films. And my hundred favorite movie list, I would say probably a third – uh, to half our comedies, man. Right. I love comedies. They're such a great escape. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. You know, they, there's a tendency to not value comedy. They they're forced to, you know, once Jim Carrey started doing Truman Show and mm. you know, um, Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind, then yeah. they're like, oh, these guys are uh, Robin Williams, Good Will Hunting. Oh, now right, they're right. real actors. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, get out of here. These guys are. Yeah, they're great. Um, we only have a few minutes left. One thing I did want to touch on is uh, I've dabbled in stand-up comedy. And one of the things that inspired me to do stand-up comedy is when I would be at work and we'd be lounging around the office just talking about what we did over the weekend, I would share stories from my youth or a date that I went on that weekend that in my eyes was tragic and sad, you know? And I would convey these stories to friends and they would be on the floor Tears in their eyes, laughing hysterically. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. No, that was a painful moment. And that would make them laugh harder. And I realized that tragedy breeds comedy. Yeah. So I had met a stand-up comedian. Uh, we worked together. And I said, you know, that's something I've thought about. And he goes, well, do it. And I'm like, I don't know where to begin. He goes, you write. Write something. And so I went home, wrote out some of those tragic stories about dating and stuff like that gave it to my buddy and he said this is good he says i'm gonna get you on the stage at the comedy castle i'm like whoa whoa this is moving fast yeah he's like you want to do it or not i said yeah sure so i kind of honed it all into like when you do open mic at the comedy castle they give you like seven minutes or so so i tried to have front loaded good seven minutes my buddy contacted mark ridley said i'm gonna get you on the stage the day comes i'm a nervous wreck i went up there did the same thing I did with my friends. I would share these horror stories, these dating horror stories, and people were falling out of their chairs laughing. And I'm like, I kind of like this. Yeah, this yeah. is kind of cool. And so a lot of comedians have tragic backgrounds, tragic histories, abuse, yep. and they somehow take that and channel it and and make it funny and you know, people, I guess, they're like, if it's happening to you, it's funny. If, if it's happening yeah. to me, it's not so funny. Yeah. Um, but that's what I learned is that a lot of comedians channel that darkness into laughs. And, and that's kind of encapsulates exactly what we're and talking about. And that's first today. rush because Farley and his uh, college roommate did a kind of like a show, a theater show. They got great laughs. They came off the stage. Farley turns to his uh, college roommate and goes... <laughs> That's what we want to do for the rest of our life. Right? Exactly. Wow. That feeling. It's an epiphany, yeah. It's like uh, under enough pressure, uh, a, piece oh, okay. of, a, a, I, pe- a piece of coal <laughs> will turn into a diamond. Yeah. <laughs> for those of us who are watching, I tip my hat to Joe and to Andrew. Andrew's done improv, mm. and you've done stand-up. That is, hey. you talk about courage. Hey, mm. sketch. And they're they're mm. two sketch, completely right? different things, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, could, I could write for stand-up. I couldn't do yeah. it myself. For, for me, stand-up is writing, and I don't think a lot of people... If you're a good stand-up, you make it look like you're making it up as you go. Right, yes. When really it's written. Uh, improv, you might have some prepared bits, but for the most part, you're thinking on the fly. Yeah. And it's two completely uh, different approaches to comedy. But yes. I think what was it? uh, it's when what, done well... Stand-up is jumping out of a plane without a parachute. <laughs> improv is being fired out of a cannon without a net. Yeah. <laughs> there you there go. go. That's right. 
All right, well, that brings uh, this week's uh, Hollywood crime scene to an end, a uh, topic that's near and dear to my heart, obviously. Uh, Maginos Pete, Andrew Walker, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Thank Joe. Thank you, Joe.